great singing. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Faithway Baptist Church. We are so glad that you came here to join us this morning. Um, we are blessed to gather and worship the Lord as a church body. We're just so glad you're here. The scripture says uh, in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We are especially grateful for the spiritual blessings he's endowed upon us. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to gather together this morning and to worship you. Father, I pray that the service would be an encouragement to all that are here. I pray that, uh, Lord, your word would be, would be clearly spoken and that it would, it would accomplish what it is set forth to accomplish. Lord, I pray that we would be spiritually benefited from the time we spend together. I pray also, Father, that you would open our hearts to the truth of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a church, we have our memory verses, and this is the last week in June to memorize these verses. So let's say them together. Psalm 139, 9 and 10. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall my hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139, 9 through 10. Well, let's stand together this morning, and we're going to sing song 324, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We have a wonderful Savior who gave all for us. Let's sing it out, song number 324. He's done for us. We're going to continue singing this morning in the Wild Hymnal, song number 43, How Can I Fear? These verses are very encouraging to me. The scripture says in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The scripture says, And the peace of God 
which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ, through Christ Jesus. What an encouraging promise in the scripture that we don't have to be anxious, we don't have to fear, we can trust in the Lord, we can cast our cares upon him, we can pray, and he is there for us, he's with us. Let's sing it out, song 43 in the wilds. from 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. 1 John 2, starting in verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out and they, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 
Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. Thank you, Brother Pete. Um, this next song, Find Us Faithful, um, is a very convicting song, even to me. I, I, I may not um, be older, but I know that I have children who are going to follow behind me. And um, I'm very thankful for the children that I have, but I want to pass on to them that what has been passed on to me and, and has been passed on to you as well. Let's stand this morning. We're going to sing Find Us Faithful um, one more time this June. on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. Lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Thank you. Great singing. You may be seated. At this time, we are going to dismiss our children to go with Mr. Alex to Junior Church and Mr. Gavin thankful for their help and they're going to have a great time in junior church today really thankful for brother alex he's able to come up from downers grove and he is the um he is going to be at the neighborhood bible time rally there it's only about 45 minutes away and so we're very excited for him and we're going to enjoy having him on wednesday as well um
Now, I wanted to quickly mention that we have um, a few visitors, not going to mention all of them by name, but we have a visiting missionary, and he has faithfully served the Lord for over three decades in Brazil, and we are so grateful that he came to visit this, this, this morning. Him and his wife, Gary and Yvonne uh, Trometer, we're so glad that they were able to be here, and we're so thankful for your faithful service to the Lord for decades. And, um, you know, that's, that's what the song was talking about that we were just reviewing. Now, before we get into the message, I did want to mention that we had a wonderful time with the children at junior camp this week. And uh, I just wanted to give a couple quick highlights about it. Um, the campers, they had a phenomenal time, and, and it was very formational in a lot of ways for these young people, but um, there were a total of nine services that they got to experience. And um, we're very grateful for Pastor Loggins. He did a phenomenal job with the children. It was full of songs, um, and children loved to sing those songs. And, um, and they heard a five-day story about Shadow Mountain and the spiritual application application that was included in that story, and um, they heard practical truths that they can understand at their age. One thing that was hit over and over, and what I loved about it, was specifically that the kids remembered it very clearly. This is a truth that will stick with them. Um, he taught the children that character means to do right. And so he'd say, character means to do, and they would say right. And then he would say, to do right. Um, and he says, in order to do right, we need to pay attention we pay attention so that we can obey, and the kids would follow along. They would say, uh, he, would, he would just leave the blank for them to fill in, and then um, we obey, and then we receive a blessing, and then he said, we receive a blessing, and we're to be content with what we're given, and um, there was a statement that struck me. He told me um, personally that he takes a lot of the messages that he would preach to the adults, and he, and he makes them kid-sized, you know, he brings them down to their level, and he said that um, contentment is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. And um, I think those truths are really going to resonate with those children. It's going to stick with them. And we're so thankful for all of the support for the folks who gave so that the children could go and for those who were praying for them. We know that many of you were praying for them this week, and um, we're really thankful that you did. Um, we're, we, I get to go again this week with the teenagers, and uh, if you pick up a bulletin on your way out or in, um, it has a little handout that has their names in it, so be, please be praying for them this week, um, that as they go up to Camp Joy, that, that God would speak to their hearts. We know, um, and the children would probably tell you about how fun the lake was, and uh, about how much fun all the games were, and believe it or not, how delicious the camp food was. You don't normally hear that. But um, in all of that, um, they really were given an opportunity to, to grow. And I'm just so thankful that we had four campers that were able to go and thankful for the church, for you all that participated and prayed for them. Um, let's take our Bibles and let's open them to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 this morning. We're going to begin in verse number 16. Matthew 28 and verse 16. Matthew 28 and verse 16. As you're turning there, um, you may know exactly where I am going to go with this message. Why do you say that? Because the principle that Jesus taught, this command, is one of the greatest known commands in all of Christianity. What do you mean by that? Well, many people will know that Jesus said that the greatest command is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. But what is also known by many Christians is that Christ gave a commission, his final words, his final instructions to his disciples before he left earth. And that commission um, is what we're going to be discussing today. Now, there is a difference between knowing a principle from God's word and obeying. The scripture says that we ought to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So as important as it is, for the Christian believer to learn and know what God teaches in his word, it is equally important that we obey what we know. And this passage of scripture is a passage that applies to every 
believer that is a Christian. We ought to follow it. We take step forward in growth and in obedience to Christ as we, as we spiritually mature. So um, the question being, are we obeying this great commission of Christ? Let's read our passage beginning in verse number 16. The scripture says in Matthew 28, uh, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Throughout Christ's ministry, we see his heart for others. We see that Christ was moved with compassion for others. Um, the scripture says in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So if you'll turn with me quickly to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. What's interesting is that Jesus did this throughout his life. He taught this throughout his ministry. And it was also his final commandment. In Matthew chapter 9, we're going to read verses 35 through 38. The scripture says in Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's bow for prayer this morning. Father, thank you for your word and for the teachings of it. Lord, I thank you for your example and for your inspiration. Lord, we're excited to learn what you have to say in your word this morning. But Father, I just pray that you'd help us to be a going church, help us to be uh, involved in our communities, help us to be um, a church that cares about the Great Commission, a church that is others-minded. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning as we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Jesus spent those three years of his ministry with multitudes, with individuals, and with his disciples. Um, but his final command was not his first his first mention of the concept. It wasn't the first time that Jesus had this attitude or heart towards others. It, his life showed what he was talking about. You see, um, Jesus has the power to save souls and change lives. And he has entrusted us as Christian believers with the honorable responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. And he passed this baton of disciple-making to his disciples, and they passed it on to others who were willing to follow Christ. I want you to consider something that Jesus spent his three years of ministry uh, uh, developing his disciples. He certainly ministered to the multitudes and did many miracles, and he did many works, and his heart was moved with compassion, but he invested in the lives of his 12 disciples. And when he ascended into heaven, it was his disciples that fulfilled the Great Commission and built the church. It was the Lord that saved them, but it was the disciples that were used by God. What an amazing partnership that the Lord saves, we point others to Christ. And um, there, there's an illustration for this. I, I find it very interesting. Um, maybe you're familiar with a relay baton race, and there is the, uh, there is the exchange. Um, if you've ever watched, they have to be in sync. They have to have perfect timing. They have to pass the baton from the right hand of the runner to the left hand of the one who is to take it and move on with it. And Jesus, he, he on earth lived 33 years. He, he lived, he died, he resurrected, he ascended into heaven, and he passed on the baton 
to his disciples. And those disciples passed on the baton to other Christians. And so on and so forth until here we are today where we have been given the gospel. We have been given the Great Commission and we are to take that baton and run with it. Jesus still saves and the Great Commission is still to be obeyed. We know that this is a message that is for all people of all time. I'm excited to, to discuss why in a moment. But, but what part, this is the question of the message today, what part does the Lord want you to have in fulfilling the Great Commission? What part does the Lord want you to have in fulfilling the Great Commission? You see, there can be a reluctancy, a hesitation. Christians can be unsure whether they will take on the baton and run with it. But we ought to consider the eternal ramifications of doing so. Um, firstly, let's consider the context, the apostles. Let's consider the apostles. You see, in this passage of Scripture in Matthew 28, the Great Commission was given to Jesus' remaining disciples, the eleven. And according to the text, um, what we understand, in Matthew 28, we see his resurrection. Um, in the middle of the passage, we see how the chief priest bri bribed the soldiers. And we come to the Great Commission, and sometimes we only go into verses 19 and 20. Or sometimes we only go to 18, 19, and 20. But I think that there is some very important truth here in verses 16 and 17 that fit the context. We understand that Jesus appeared to several different people. He appeared to individuals. He appeared to the disciples several times. And so the disciples had received instructions by Jesus to meet him in a mountain in Galilee. And so the scripture says that they went into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. They obeyed Jesus. It continues that when they saw him, they worshipped him. That is significant. Um, Jesus is certainly deserving and worthy of our worship. He is God in the flesh. He is not another man. Amen? And um, what is significant to consider about these disciples is in this text, the Scripture says, some doubted. Some doubted Jesus. Who are the some? Some consider this passage to be the time when Jesus appeared to the 500 disciples, but the Bible says clearly that it was the 11 disciples. So when we look at verse 17, the ones that were doubting, it's not saying all doubted. It says that they went and that they worshipped, but some doubted. Even Jesus' disciples doubted. Why was that the case? I found this very significant. You see, they had followed Jesus for three years expecting that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. He was going to overthrow the Roman Empire, rule and reign as its king. And when Jesus was arrested, their faith was shaken. When Jesus was crucified and died, their faith was shattered. This man who they had seen do miracles and teach that he is the Son of God has died. Their faith has been shattered and now these disciples hear that Jesus is resurrected. What an amazing truth to find out that the Savior, He has resurrected. They didn't understand the full context of the Scripture, that He was the suffering Savior, came to die for our sins. They didn't understand that yet. But... That Jesus was resurrected. He had even appeared to them before. He had given them instructions. They obeyed. They worshipped him. But they were still doubting. Um, what is the significance of them doubting? Well, I'd like to point out two significant factors of this. The first is that they were not perfect. When we consider the apostles, Jesus' followers, they were human just like we are. And that commission that was given to them, the Great Commission, was not given to people who were perfect, who never had any struggles, who never doubted, who never, who never disobeyed. No, they were human just like we are, and they obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. That is very significant. One, one example of a disciple that doubted was Thomas. Let's turn to John chapter 20 and read this account 
in verses 24 through 29. You see, Thomas' faith was shattered. He was a doubter. Why was he a doubter? Well, because everything he had believed seemed to be turning on itself. John chapter 20, we're going to read verses 24 through 29. The scripture tells us in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is before these other appearances. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of his nails, and put my finger into the print of, his nails, of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side where Jesus had been speared, I will not believe. Thomas' faith was so shaken, he doubted so heavily that he would not believe unless he saw physical, tangible evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Okay? And the scripture says that after eight days again, his disciples were within, within a room, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut, he appeared in the middle, the Bible says, and stood in the midst. The scripture says, it said, peace be unto you. Then, see, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas, he was not a perfect disciple, but he, he had doubts, and Jesus showed him he was who he said he was. He resurrected. And Thomas answered, how do you respond to that, if that were you? The scripture says, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. What other response is there? You are who you say you are. You are resurrected. And he says in verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You see, Thomas's faith was in what he could see, but Jesus taught him that there are many, and none of us have seen Jesus. We have not seen his resurrected body. We cannot. He's in heaven. But we know by faith that he is. We trust in the resurrection account, what the scripture tells us. And we, um, the scripture says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. So if we turn back to Matthew 28, we see that some doubted. But the significance of this in this, in this doubting that, that we ought to consider is that they did not doubt for long. You see, they saw Jesus. They saw him several times. But history tells us, according to tradition, that each one of the disciples gave their life as a martyr for Jesus Christ. They may have doubted, but they settled those doubts. I think there's some practical application for us there. You see, Jesus gave his great commission to people who he doubted sometimes. And as Christians, there can be times when we have doubts. What do you mean by doubts? The word doubt is talking about wavering. So you kind of picture someone that's on the fence. They're not sure which way to commit. If they are going to give their life to Christ, if they are going to live their lives for themselves, so forth. But what we see is that even those that doubted, Jesus gave them his commission and they fulfilled it. They decided. And that's what we ought to do as well. You see, um, you don't have to be perfect to obey Christ's command. If that was the case, only Christ could obey, obey this command. But Christ provides the enabling. Um, what we ought to do as Christians is we ought to settle those doubts. What do you mean by that? It's okay for a Christian to have questions and to wonder and to examine what they believe. Why is that? Because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. If a Christian can never ask a question, then how do we know that what we believe is true? You see, as Christians, it is so important that we not only know what we believe, but why we believe it and why it is true. We trust in the Lord and we answer those questions. You see, um, it's not questioning, looking to see where we could find fault. It is 
asking, is this true? And the disciples, even though their faith was shaken, even though they doubted, even though they wavered, they were settled. Which brings us to our second point. The first point is that we ought to consider the apostles. The second point is we ought to consider the omnipotent Savior. This is exciting. The scripture says in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The entire context of the Great Commission is begun with this statement. All power is given unto me. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. What does that mean? What is that referring to? Um, it, it, we're going to discuss how it provides our inspiration for obedience, but it means that Jesus has the power to save. He can save any that call and come to him for salvation. You see, Jesus is the only means of salvation. There is no name given among men whereby ye must be saved. Only Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the only way. The scripture says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, many consider this to be a narrow view. And Jesus explained that many go into the broad way of destruction, but few find the straight and narrow way of salvation. But the scripture teaches us that the second new birth places us into the family of God. We are sons and daughters of God. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ has all power. He is the only one that can save. The scripture says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, to be saved, we must receive Christ. We must believe in his name. Jesus has the power to save anyone. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? If the answer is no, or I don't know, then I would love to show you how you can accept Christ as your Savior today because he has the power to save anyone that cries out to him. Why do I need a Savior? What do I need saving from? We need saving from our sin. We're all sinners who are, have broken God's law. The scripture uses the word sinner because we're not just imperfect. We're not just average. We have broken God's law and sinned against a holy God. And heaven being a perfect place, God being a righteous judge, cannot allow any sin to enter into heaven. The example is of a judge. And we understand that God is our judge and that a judge cannot overlook a crime because of a person's good works. What do you mean by that? Well, when we think about our good works versus our bad works, we're often convinced that the our way to heaven must be for our good works to outweigh our bad works. But you see, we are not judged based on the merits of our good or bad works. We are judged based on our sins. You see, if a murderer or a thief tries to tout their great life and how they've never done anything like this before, it does not matter to the judge. The judge must judge the crime. And God being a holy God, a righteous judge, cannot, it would go against his nature, overlook sin. And so, the reason why we need a Savior, the reason why we need Christ's power to save us is because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. You see, Jesus has the power to save, but Jesus is the only means of salvation. Let me be very clear according to the Scripture. Titus 3.5 clearly states, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his, does anybody know the next word? Mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says for, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by are ye saved through 
and that not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, there is no other means of salvation. Jesus is the only way. He taught that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Um, it is, heaven is unattainable. It is unreachable apart from Christ. Jesus provides the only way to heaven. The only way. The Bible doesn't teach us that all roads lead to heaven or that everyone will go to heaven. The only way to receive salvation is through Jesus Christ because Jesus has the power to save. He is the only one that can save. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So I'd like to ask two questions because this one is what we come to as we get to verses 19 and 20. For the lost here, you say... If you, if you answer that question, is Jesus your Savior? No, or I don't know, this is the message for you this morning. You must be born again. You must trust Christ alone for salvation. You must, you must depend on Him to be saved. So for the saved, this is our foundation for the Great Commission. That Jesus saved us, and He has the power to save others. Let me give... Um, let me, let, me, let, me, let me make it practical for a moment. I want you to think about, if you're saved here this morning, the person who led you to the Lord. And I want you to think about the people who were involved in your salvation. It's the ones who shared the gospel with you. The ones who showed you how to be saved. Praise the Lord for them. That they took the time to share the gospel with you that they were bold, not afraid of what you would think of them, that they took the Great Commission seriously. They cared about you. God wants us to do the same thing for other people. He wants us to share the gospel with them because Jesus saved you. You know, the great example is that we do not save anyone. We just point people to Jesus. We just show them how they can be saved, how they could put their faith in Christ. We show them so that they can be. And that is so important that we would understand this. Let me ask you a question. Who do you know that is lost that needs to be saved? You see, Jesus has all power, and um, he, is, he is the way, the truth, and life. Now, um, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. I'd like to share a few verses here, because if you're familiar with these verses, you understand verse 13 teaches that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord knows who will be saved, but we don't. We have no idea who the Lord is working on, who the Holy Spirit is speaking to, and how he's working in their life. But we do know the promise from the scripture that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's read verses 13. Uh, we'll read beginning in verse number 14 since we read that verse. The scripture says, Romans 10, 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, we are to be a preacher of the gospel. God wants us to be a preacher of the gospel. We are to share the good news of salvation with others. You see, that is the gospel, that Jesus has the power to save. So we've considered our first two points, that we ought to consider the apostles. And we ought to consider our omnipotent Savior. Jesus has all power but this provides our inspiration. The scripture says, or, or, or our third point is that we ought to consider the great commission, the command of the great commission. You see, up until now, we've discussed Jesus' power to save and, and the disciples' doubt and ultimate uh, reconciliation of that doubt. 
But in verse 19, we find the command for the believer. The scripture says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go. And the scripture says, in, right after go, ye therefore. Therefore, because Jesus has all power, because Jesus can save, we are to go. The scripture says to go, to not stay, to go with the gospel to others. The scripture says to teach all nations. Now, what we realize from the scripture is that in Acts 1.8, Jesus commanded his disciples to go to Jerusalem, to Samaria, to Judea, to Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And that is exactly the order that the, the disciples, Jesus' apostles, followed. They went to Jerusalem. They waited till the day of Pentecost. And they saw uh, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls saved. The Bible says they were baptized and added to the church, the church of 120 believers. There was added to there. And from there, they continued to go. And they continued to go into Judea and Samaria. And we see that the gospel exploded across the Roman Empire and around the world. Why? Because they obeyed. They went. You see, what does it mean to teach all nations. Teach all nations means to make disciples. Make disciples. That's what that word teach means in the Greek. To make disciples. And disciple making is not a one-step process. If it were, then we would say, why didn't the church just continue to have 3,000 every single day and keep adding 3,000? It was because there's more to it than just going. It is also baptism and teaching the disciples, okay? Um, so we're going to get there. But what do we mean by a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And this is where it gets interesting, that the disciples followed Jesus for three years and then went out into the world to make other disciples and accomplish the Great Commission, right? So they obeyed Jesus' command and they made disciples, but they made disciples who would, as it teaches here, to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, who would obey the Great Commission, you see, it wasn't just about them adding to the church. It was about multiplication. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I just like to, to drive this point home here. You see, um, if we, if, 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 if the pastors and, and the staff and, and different people in the church, if there were maybe five people that led 10 people to the Lord in a year, then praise the Lord over their lifetime in ministry, they would see thousands of people saved. But if we were to take that same effort, you see, that's addition. If we were to take that, we don't want subtraction. We don't want division. We, want, we do want addition. But if we want to see the Great Commission fulfill, fulfilled, we need to see multiplication. What do you mean by that? Well, disciples making disciples making disciples. You see, the influence and effect that we can have in fulfilling the Great Commission is that we make disciples who also make disciples. There's a multiplication of that. What do you, let, me, let me give this um, statistic to you. If we were, if, if, if I were to lead one person to the Lord in a year and take that year to disciple that Christian believer, and then the next year I would find another one, and that disciple that I was able to spend time with and mentor, and that disciple also brought one person in a year, then the next year we would have four. And then it would continue to double. And if we continue to double, we would reach the population of the world in 23 years. If we were to double and multiply the way now I understand when we say this, one year is not the scripture says to teach, I'm getting ahead of myself, to teach all things whatsoever I've commanded you. It is a lifetime process. It is, it is, there's much to teach of Jesus' commandments here, but we get the idea that the 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 idea is not addition. As important as addition is, as important as evangelism evangelism is, 
It is disciple making. It is multiplication. Why do you say that? Well, because it can be very easy for a church to become very pragmatic and to ask themselves, what can we do? How can we get as many people as possible saved? We're to share the gospel as much as possible with as many people as possible. Don't, don't get me confused here. But it's very easy to compromise Jesus Christ's commands to be more seeker-friendly, to try to get more people to make a decision. Well, we realize the church is not a service to attend one day a week and then to continue with our lives the rest of the week. It is a part of our entire life. We don't stop being Christians when we go, to church, when we go home Sunday afternoon. We don't stop being Christians on Monday when we go to work. We continue. And what does that mean for the Christian? That means at our workplaces. That means in our neighborhoods. We want to see other people make the same decision that we made. What decision is that? To accept Christ as their Savior. We want to see them discipled. We want to share the gospel with them. But we don't want to compromise. We want to realize that it is more than just going. It is more than just evangelizing. It is the whole thing. What do you mean by the whole thing? Well, the scripture says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So um, what we saw in the church at Acts in, in Jerusalem was that they were saved. And because they were saved, they were baptized and they were added to the church. And they were taught, as, as the scripture teaches, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, um, and it is the first step of obedience after salvation. That's what baptism is. If you've been baptized, it is because you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Not for, it is not to save you. It is publicly identifying with Christ. I'm excited because in a few weeks we get to have a baptism service. And we get to baptize those who have accepted Christ as their Savior recently. But what we realize is that is a part of being a disciple. A disciple of Jesus identifies with Christ in believer's baptism. So it is not just evangelism. It is not just baptism. It is also teaching. Teaching. This teaching word is a very general word. And it is so important for us to, to realize this aspect that we're to teach all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So how can we practically apply this to our lives? We've considered um, the apostles, the omnipotent Savior, the Great Commission. How can I apply this to my life? Um, we, we have a fourth point in a moment, but um, we ought to, as we read in Matthew chapter 9 earlier, pray for the lost. We ought to pray for the lost. There ought to be people that you know who are unsaved that we are praying for their salvation. There, uh, I have several on my list, but um, I am praising the Lord because last week I was able to lead one of them to the Lord. And God wants to save them. The Bible is very clear that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, okay? But he wants to save what is Jesus' prayer request? He said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. Pray for laborers. Pray for laborers. Pray about being a laborer for Christ. Pray about how God can use you to share the gospel with others. What part does God have for you in fulfilling the Great Commission? Do the work. So we understand, according to the scripture, that often the work is gardening. One plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. And we realize that there are times and we rejoice when there is a time of reaping, when someone gets saved and the work has begun to begin discipling them. But what we realize is that a lot of the work is planting and watering and you don't see anything. If you are a farmer, then you know that it is important to continue to plant and water because that is going to eventually produce fruit. But we may not see the fruit, and we may not know what fruit is being accomplished. But the Lord does, and the Lord uses it. So we ought to do the work of filling. We ought to be ready to share the gospel. We ought to be ready to share the gospel. We ought to carry tracks with us so that we can, uh, get, even if it's just leaving someone a gospel track, that we are ready. We know what to say if someone were to ask a question. We seek 
opportunities. You see, Jesus didn't say in the scripture that you are to gather in the church and then those people who join you for the service, those are the people who you are supposed to go after with the gospel. He didn't say make sure that they come in first. He said go out to them. And we are to be ready to share the gospel with them. We are to seek those opportunities. Um, now, one reason why a lot of people do not share their faith is because they worry about what it will be like if somebody asks them a question. They're not really sure. That's where the scripture says to study to show thyself approved unto God and that we might um, uh, be ready al always to give an answer to everyone that asks us a reason of the hope that is in you. So, Finally, we have considered the Apostles, the Omnipotent Savior, the Great Commission, and finally, let us consider the Savior's promise. The verse 20, the scripture says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This promise is that Jesus will always be with us. Now, he ascended into heaven, but his spirit is with us. His Holy Spirit was given to us, and he taught us that he will never, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Um, personally, um, when I go out uh, door knocking into our community, um, I personally don't like going to doors by myself. I don't mind. I do it, um, but I don't really like doing it by myself. But what we realize is that it doesn't matter whether you're at work or knocking on someone's door. If you're by yourself, you're not by yourself because Jesus is with you. He is always with you. He will never not be with you. So when we realize he has the power to save and he is with us encouraging, that provides great motivation and encouragement. When we get discouraged by a response, we realize Jesus is with me. He knows what I've experienced. He can help me comfort. Um, we do not need to fear. We do not need to be afraid. Um, when we don't have to be afraid of how people are going to respond. We just need to share the gospel with them. Um, yesterday, uh, me and my wife and our boys went through a car wash, and, um, and uh, you know, it's been a while since we've had a car wash, but, um, and, and uh, thankfully they had a vacuum there too. But while we were going through the car wash, um, it was loud, and the, um, all of the things that happened in a car wash, and um, Luke was panicking a little bit. Uh, you know, he's just a year and a half, and so he was starting to cry, and, and he wasn't really sure uh, what was going on, you know, why is this thunderstorm hitting our car? And so um, I reached back, and uh, I just grabbed his little hand, and I held on to it, and, and he calmed down. And I talked softly to him and said, hey, it's okay, I'm right here. And Luke was comforted, and he was at peace, he was okay, because dad is holding his hand. Dad is with him. Yes, don't know what's going on, but he's right here. And Jesus is with us as well. His presence is with us. We don't go alone. We're not by ourselves. He knows. He knows what we're going through. He knows, and he is there for us. Um, there are a few promises, in my opinion, as encouraging as the promise that Jesus is always with us. Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to, to circle back to our first point. I said that the disciples, um, uh, they settled their faith and their doubts because they gave their lives for Christ. But it wasn't just because they gave their lives for Christ. You see, there were approximately 100 million in the population of the world at that time. And by the first century, after the apostles had shared the gospel, the gospel had exploded, gone throughout the world, there were approximately 10 million Christians who received Christ. Is that everyone? Is that the entire population? No. But they went into all the world and preached the gospel. You see, uh, I don't know uh, that that was every single person that could have been saved because there's always more that could be done. But we have 8 billion people in our world today. How many have heard the gospel? How many know their need of salvation? How many know that Christ can save them and realizing that it is the narrow way, it is only through Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, you know, 
we, we, we mentioned this, and I'll just, just close with this final thing, that, um, that it, many consider that number of 8 billion people to be an impossible number, but it's not impossible for the Lord. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, they consider it to be impossible, but it is not impossible for the Lord. God can save, God can work, and God can use us, our church, to reach our Jerusalem, to reach Hampshire, and, um, and I hope that we will be challenged by this message to do that. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I'd just like to ask you questions as Ms. Flowers comes. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask this first question, and I asked this several times during the message, but this first question is this, and I'd just like to pray for you if this is. Is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? If that's you, Jesus is my Savior, would you raise your hand? I'm saved. Jesus is my Savior. I've accepted Him as my Savior. Thank you. Put your hands down. Is there anyone here who would say, Pastor Tim, I do not know for sure that Jesus is my Savior. The answer is no or I don't know. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'd just like to pray for you. I, Jesus is not my Savior. I don't know. All right. Um, if you, if you maybe, maybe didn't raise your hand, but if you'd like to come forward to this altar, I'd love to talk to you about that, show you from the Scripture how you can know for sure your sins are forgiven, that you're on your way to heaven. Um, as the piano plays, you come. But let me ask you another question if you're a Christian believer. Are, are you a faithful witness for Christ? Do you go with the gospel to others with the intention of sharing the gospel with them? Is there anything holding you back? Is there anything keeping you from obeying this commission? Fear, doubt, insecurity, lack of knowledge. Let's commit today to being faithful, effective witnesses for Christ. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. I hope that the message was a challenge to you and encouragement. Um, I have just a few quick announcements um, before we go. The first is that next Sunday, our the MBT evangelists are going to come back in town. We're excited to have them. And we're going to have a church picnic at Bruce Green Park. And you are all invited and welcome to come. We hope you will. Um, you hope, we hope you'll bring a, a big side dish or dessert for the MBT guys because they're hungry. Um, and uh, as you know, but anyways, um, but if you can uh, sign up on the back or text us, call us, let us know that you're able to make it. Um, we'd love for you to be there if you're able to. Um, now, the other, we have a few more announcements. The second is that we have our Neighborhood Bible Time Rally. And thank you, several folks have signed up and are willing to help. And uh, we know that this is a church-wide event. And we're so excited for the opportunity that we have to fulfill the Great Commission, share the gospel with boys and girls and teens and, ch and kids in Hampshire. And so what we would like to ask is that you would be praying. Please, please, please pray for the MBT rallies, for the children's rally, for the teen rally. Um, maybe be praying about how you can participate in it. You know, in, in, in helping at one of the rallies, we've had several who volunteered to do that. Or um, maybe you'd like to pick up some things from the donation list. Whatever it is, um, pray about who God would have you to invite. Is there someone that you would like to invite to the rally? Um, uh, please pray for Pastor, for myself, for the evangelists, uh, but especially for Hampshire as we try to reach them with the gospel. Now, um, there are flyers on the back. And there is, of course, the sign-up sheets where we're the MBT information is, but um, if you'd like to take some and just pass them out to some of your neighbors, um, that'd be awesome. If you think about who you can give those to. Now, two quick final announcements um, is that the first one is pastor's fifth grandchild was born on Friday. Um, so 
Um, he is there in North Carolina, um, and he is going to be um, returning soon. Uh, his na- the baby's name is Titus Maverick Hassel, and he was 7 pounds, 11 ounces, and 19 inches. So uh, praise the Lord for a healthy delivery there. Um, now, we also wanted to mention that um, we had several birthdays this past week, and uh, we had a big one for Mr. Paul. And so we appreciate you, brother. We had Lainey and then also Wendy uh, had birthdays this past week. So we just wanted to recognize those. And, and um, if you get a chance, wish them a happy belated birthday. All right. Well, God bless you. And we will hopefully fellowship and, and connect together. You are dismissed.